Well, thank you very much. Uh, just for the benefit of the audience to explain, I, I'm a ex-politician. I, I used to be in the cabinet in the coalition days and then leader of the Liberal Democrats, but I'm now a retired politician. And I'm working at the Overseas Development Institute uh, and also the London School of Economics. Um, and in particular, I'm working on the impact of China and India on the world economy, these new super states that are gradually replacing the West as the centre of gravity of the world economy. Um, but the context uh, in which this is happening is what we loosely call globalisation, um, which on one level is a form of international economic integration, uh, but also is now becoming a highly political concept. You will probably know about President Trump, who campaigned against the evils of globalization. And there is a strand of mainly right wing politics in the West, which is regards the integration of the world economy as um, negative and, and contrary to national values. But let me first of all explain what I mean and give the definition. If you could change for me. Uh, I mean, we're talking about lots of different things. Um, people use the word globalization rather loosely, but essentially we're talking about a world where trade has been growing faster than uh, national economies. Uh, there is a growing amount of service trade across borders. This is partly tourism. It's partly um helping with kind of insurance and banking across national borders. It's also about foreign investment. This is sort of Apple investing in China. Uh, it's um, big computer companies investing in India, uh, foreign direct investments in mining in Africa, and creating behind it global supply chains, because, of course, a lot of people are providing inputs to these foreign investments overseas. Uh, it's also a world where capital flows, money flows, um, more than exchange controls can limit it. Indeed, many countries have got rid of controls on a, a foreign exchange. It's also a world of financial markets, which are global in character. This is New York, London, uh, also increasingly you know, Shanghai, Tokyo. Uh, where uh, bonds are traded internationally, what we call portfolio clothes, uh, uh, buying shares in foreign companies. Uh, Globalisation is also about communications, um, the ease of air travel, sea travel, um, telephony, um, the global internet, uh, lots of emails, videos, large data flows, integrating the world. Um, to some extent, migration, the big controversy in the UK at the moment about net migration figures, the reflection of the globalization of people movements, um, what we call the global commons. These are things that you know the world has in common, but uh, need management, you know, the climate change, the management of the oceans and deep sea fishing, pandemics. These are things that can't be controlled and managed by one country alone. And then what's rather pompously called global governance, which is the system of rulemaking internationally, the World Trade Organization standard setting bodies, which set the standards for plugs, electric plugs or um, other forms of equipment internationally. So they're compatible uh, regional agreements like the European Union. And then lastly, what I call soft globalism. I mean, football is a very good example of a globalized uh, industry, but it also applies to film, to many ideas which are traded on, on the web, um, people's fashion, uh, the use of language, which increasingly is English. So, so all these are dimensions of globalization. But th there is one measure in particular which captures really what the globalization debate's about, and that's in relation to trade. Uh, and this is a chart going back two centuries, and it measures the amount of trade as a share of national economies. And what you can see is that during the 19th century, uh, trade became progressively important. This is the first era of globalization. And this was, a, you know, basically ships moved from sailing boats to steam powered. 
Um, in the middle of the, in the end of the 19th century, you got um, um, transatlantic cables uh, so we could get telephone messages backwards and forwards. And this continued pretty much until the First World War. Um, this was, as I say, the first wave of globalization. And then there was a terrible setback. Uh, the First World War interrupted uh, trade, predictably. Uh, then we had the great crash in the 1929-1930, uh, which disrupted world trade, and it collapsed uh, right back and, until the Second World War. And then, of course, the, the war disrupted it again. But ever since 1948-49, that kind of period, the world has been rebuilding globalization. Um, this is globalization mark two, if you like. There have been one or two interruptions. Um, there's a bit of a hiccup there in the middle, which was the disruption caused by the Iran-Iraq war, which had a massive increase in oil prices and it affected world trade through recession. And then right at the top of the chart, you see another big hiccup. This is the combination of the world financial crisis in 2008. And then latterly, we've had the COVID pandemic and the war in Ukraine. And there are some people who feel that globalization is now coming to a grinding halt because of those different things. But this chart, you know, puts it in perspective. We're coming possibly to the end of a long period, over half a century, in which the world became progressively more integrated through trade. The next, please. Now, this is in terms of what it happened, what happened. The big beneficiaries of globalization have essentially been the big emerging markets. Now, by that we mean it was initially, you know, Korea, Singapore, uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, um, but then other countries, bigger countries, started to become part of the world economy through trade. China, uh, after the end of Mao Zedong. Uh, and then, you know, much of the rest of the developing world has become increasingly important in terms of trade. And you see that the yellow, sorry, the green wedge is becoming bigger and bigger and now accounts pretty much for over half of world trade. Whereas the, the G7, you know, the developed countries who were meeting this week on in Hiroshima, um, Europe, North America and Japan, that has shrunk. Um, that is that is the big consequence of globalization. It's been this shift in the center of gravity of the world economy through trade towards the big emerging developing economies of which China is very much at the center. Next one, please. Another feature of globalization is that, although we use the word global, a lot of it has actually been regional in character. And up on the top left, you can see the European Union. Much of the growth of world trade has taken place within the European Union and with its associates, so, you know, the economic area, which is Norway, uh, countries like Turkey. You know, and a lot of world trade has been within the European Union. And we're seeing these regional groupings developing elsewhere at the bottom, increasing attempts to integrate uh, African economies. On the far right, you see Mercosur, which is um, Brazil and Argentina and the countries of South America. And then that big, complicated um, set of loops in the middle are some of the schemes that are developing in the Asia Pacific. You've got ASEAN, um, which is essentially Southeast Asia, uh, which is growing very rapidly. Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia. You've got uh, NAFTA, which is renegotiated by President Trump, uh, including the United States. And then there's another grouping called the RCEP, which is China driven. Um, again, a lot, of, a lot of these groups are overlapping. Uh, and the, the dotted line is within a new grouping, which is called the CPTPP, that was launched by President Obama originally, which is the Asia Pacific grouping. Um, and that the design of that was to link um, North American and um, Asian countries together. But President Trump tried to sabotage it. It still continues. And perversely, the British have decided to join it. We, we've left the European Union. 
that the government has decided we're really part of Asia. Um, you may reflect on that a little bit. Um, and so Britain is is a kind of honorary member of this grouping. China has applied to join, as has Taiwan, which is going to cause some difficulty further down the line. Now, um, all of this regional integration and global integration has largely been beneficial. It's contributed to rising living standards, because that's what trade tends to do. That's what your orthodox trade theory will tell you. Um, but there has been a growing um, negativity, particularly in some of the developed countries, particularly in the United States, with Trump, uh, with his MAGA, Make America Great Again, which is very much a reaction against um, globalization. Um, and the complaint is that, that particular groups of workers have been displaced by trade particularly from china uh, and that globalization may have widened uh, inequalities within the united states and indeed for the western countries but at a global level this is manifestly not true if we can have a look at the next one um this is was an attempt to measure poverty on a worldwide basis a bit difficult um, and they, I think, probably just ignore the blue and the green lines, um, except that they do point out that the share of the world population in poverty has fallen fairly steadily as the world has become more integrated, except there's a bit of flatlining between 1920 and 1940, which was that period when globalization was interrupted. But the important line there is the red line, that in the last 40 years, we've seen the number of people in extreme poverty drastically falling. And this is mainly a consequence of what happened in China, where under Deng Xiaoping, China became integrated with the world economy. Um, hundreds of millions of poor people uh, from the countryside went to work in cities. Uh, wages and st living standards grew. Uh, the same thing happening to a small extent in, in South Asia. Uh, and the number of people in extreme poverty now falling to very low levels. Much of that's concentrated in Africa, but even there, um, poverty levels in general uh, were falling, at least until the pandemic. That, that certainly interrupted the process. Uh, but nonetheless, um, uh, despite that positive story, there is a kind of backlash taking place uh, against globalization. And let me just show you some of the factors involved there. Um, different issues, but President Trump led this campaign against globalization. Uh, COVID had the effect of reminding us that we were dependent on global supply chains. One of the reasons we've now got inflation is because supply chains were interrupted and, and the reconnections have pushed up prices. Uh, Brexit was, whatever you may think about it, was another process, part of a process of breaking up the world economy, which had hitherto been integrated. The British opting out of a very close trade relationship. Uh, the Ukraine war has given another twist to the story and the imposition of sanctions uh, on Russia and Russia's allies. Um, we've also seen that global trade rules uh, through the World Trade Organization have been weakened. And that was, again, part of the result of President Trump, who stopped supporting the World Trade Organization. And then now we've got this growing split between the, the United States and China, uh, decoupling, as it's called, and the issues around Taiwan. Um, but before getting into the U.S.-China issue in some detail, let me just reflect a little bit about what globalization under threat could lead to. Perhaps. This is actually what happened in the interwar period when the, the, the Great Crash, um, 1929, um, I think you probably know the story, uh, when the United States in particular, its output fell by about 30% far, far worse than we experienced recently with COVID and before that, the financial crisis. It's just a, a mega, mega collapse of um, the American economy. And with it went world trade. And you see this cobweb 
uh, winding inward and inward and inward until um, trade levels are only about a third of what they were at the beginning. Um, and it's measured in terms of um, gold. Um, but that's an example of what happens when you get into a downward spiral of trade because connections are cut and then that in turn feeds a second round of connections. And another one, please. And this is, it's a cartoon, really, um, explaining the mentality of some of the people who are uh, trying to restrict globalization. Uh, this is partly keeping out immigrants uh, in the United States, and not, and not just the United States. Uh, a lot of the growing countries in Asia, like Japan and China, are not at all friendly to immigrants. Um, and also keeping out their, their products, um, farmers uh, in particular in, in Europe are, are very hostile to importing food products from overseas and uh, and indeed many of the things that developing countries produce like textiles uh, and there is this uh, mindset of what you might call keeping out uh, which is there it's not yet become dominant but the, 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 the anti-globalization movement has that strong although rather uh, caricatured nature but the big issue is around the growth of china and let me illustrate that in various ways because this is the the picture of the world economy as it now is and i just want to reflect a little bit on what these columns actually mean uh, the blue columns are the measure of the size of different economies measured in by current exchange rates and that's what leads people to believe that you know the united states is number one china is number two the european union as a whole uh, number three and then you get a variety of uh, of other countries which are fairly major in the world economy uh, you've got it uh, india uh, japan and of course fairly close to the bottom actually is the uk um, and, but the grey columns measure uh, the size of economies in a more realistic way <clears throat> because price levels are different in, in different types of countries. If you uh, have what you can buy with, say, $10 in the United States uh, is very much less than what you can buy with $10 in China or India or Nigeria. Um, and if you correct for price levels, that gives you a more realistic view of the size of different economies. And under this re recalculation, uh, you can see that China is now number one. It has significantly the biggest economy in the world. And also India, you see, becoming the biggest of the rest by a long way. Um, Britain is down there actually at number nine. It's been, we've now been overtaken by Indonesia. Um, so when you hear people saying about Britain being the fifth biggest economy in the world, but bear this in mind, that that's measured in a rather flattering way. And if you're doing this in a more, unreal, more realistic way, you get a very different story. Uh, and this is China becoming the world's economic superpower. Let me just illustrate that in a slightly different way. This is tracing um, the development of the size of economies over the last two centuries. Uh, and it, basically what happened, if you look at the far left column of those different combinations, you see that two centuries ago, uh, China was overwhelmingly the biggest economy in the world. This is in the um, when the Manchus were, were, were running China. There's a wonderful exhibition uh, in the British Museum at the moment about this time in history. Um, this was before the Opium Wars. Uh, China was, a, in many ways, a rather self-contained economy, but it was a country of four to 500 million people, very productive. Um, and they were the dominant economy in the world. And then gradually in the 19th century, it declined. Um, uh, they, you know, when China went through a period of enormous upheaval uh, and its economy shrunk 
Um, the number two economy in the world was India at the beginning of the last century, then under British colonial rule. It largely stagnated economically and it contracted as a share of the world. Uh, meantime, uh, other countries were coming up. Uh, the UK particularly had its industrial revolution and briefly led to the UK overtaking most of the other countries in the world, but now is on a path of relative de decline. Uh, the United States, of course, started from virtually nothing, became a, you know, the dominant economy after the Second World War, but is now in the process of relative contraction, just as the Chinese and Indians are in the phase of relative expansion. Now, th this... Um, I mean, these are just numbers, and you could argue that doesn't matter very much, but then the next chart will show why it does matter. Because what appears to be happening is, is the opening up of a great split. Instead of globalization, you have the, the beginnings of a world which is effectively dividing into two. Uh, and the way I illustrate it is if you look at the columns on the extremes, um, with the United States sort of pulling away from the rest of the world with Trump's MAGA, uh, protectionism, disowning the World Trade Organization, Biden's green subsidies, which are, you know, may well be important from an environmental point of view in America's economy, but are very much a, a um, divisive step from the world economy. And at the same time, the Chinese also pulling away from everywhere else. Um, the internet has been split in two because the Chinese control it um, in order to prevent uh, what they regard as subversive material crossing uh, through the internet. Uh, they've also aiming through the China 2030 program at a much higher level of self-sufficiency. Uh, they're controlling the markets in rare metals you had a period of zero COVID when there was virtually no contact with the rest of the world. They have this BRI, Belt and Road Initiative, which is very much a Chinese view of infrastructure connecting uh, parts of the world trading network uh, in relation to China rather than in relation to the West. Uh, what I call RMB, RMB, that's the currency, uh, deals to by bypass the dollar. Um, and a growing amount of conflict with Western countries with which they fall out, like Australia. So you've got this split happening, and it's now being reinforced by the uh, direct areas of conflict, which you see in the middle. Uh, Trump imposed tariffs on China. Uh, there are severe restrictions now on advanced semiconductors, which the Americans are trying to stop going to China. Uh, Huawei is effectively being banned from telecommunication systems in the West, and even TikTok, um, the state of Moncana in America, is now boycotted TikTok. You can't use it. Um, the Ukraine war has been another point of division. Hong Kong and AUKUS, which is a defense pact between Australia, the UK, the United States. Um, so you, you get the beginnings of a potential splitting into two of the world economy. And after the meeting this weekend, um, the Americans and the rest of the G7 are saying, we don't want to cut all our links with China, but they want to, uh, what they call, de-risk them. But in practice, that means severing a lot of the trade links that have been built up. And um, maybe great split is a slightly exaggerated view of what's happening, but there is a trend in that direction. And coming out of the great split is that instead of the, the world being preoccupied with deepening globalization, we now have an increasing obsession with security. And this is my last slide. Um, increasingly, countries worried about um, where their food, their energy, their high tech is going to come from uh, and not just uh, the benefits of trade as you will have heard about with you know adam smith and ricardo and the traditional theories of trade but increasing preoccupation with self-sufficiency uh, and worries about over -depend dependence on other countries and just to illustrate it, you've got some countries which have a great deal of leverage because they've got some um, abundant food 
um, Brazil and Argentina, also the United States, and as we saw at the beginning of the world, Russia and Ukraine. And if their uh, food supplies disappear, that affects everybody else, um, particularly the poorer countries. Um, energy is another area where security of supply has become critical. Uh, we had the Russians cutting off gas to Western Europe. Uh, OPEC has used its um, control over oil supplies, actually working in partnership with Russia uh, to try and manage the price of oil um, at the expense of major um, oil importers. And of course, the United States is largely self-sufficient in energy, which is, gives it a great deal of uh, strength. And then we have rare minerals as we move to a, a net zero uh, world economy. Uh, the new battery-powered cars require lithium and other specialist, uh, specialized minerals, which are not available everywhere. Um, the, Africa is actually the biggest source of supply of many of these uh, precious minerals. Um, also lithium, which is concentrated in Argentina and Chile. Uh, and China has already cornered a lot of the market in, in turning these minerals into usable metals, refining them. And then we have the big battle about technology, where the most advanced semiconductor plant in the world is in Taiwan, it accounts for about 80% of world supply, which is what, what is actually underlying this, this big this tension at the moment about Taiwan. Um, and countries, there's a handful of countries which have access now to the world's most sophisticated uh, technologies, uh, China and the United States primarily, but also Korea to some extent, Japan, and then countries that are vulnerable because they don't have these things. And you can see uh, potentially um, all kind of conflicts and wars potentially erupting because of lack of security of supply. So that's where globalization seems to be heading. And it's a rather worrying world and it no longer corresponds to the uh, theories we've encountered in textbooks about the benefits of international exchange. But thank you for listening. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions that anybody might have. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Vince. I appreciate that. Um, so we've got time for some Q and A's now. If you want to type any questions that you or your students have into uh, the Q and A section, I'll be able to receive those and relay them. Um, whilst you're doing that, I'll just ask a few that I've I've got here. Um, since you touched upon the ideas of the Great Split and the globalization. Um, so I was just wondering, what do you think is the kind of direction of travel then? Where do you think this is going to lead for the global economy and, and potentially for political stability as well, I guess? Um, well, in terms of the global economy, I think there, there has been an understanding in the West that until very recently, uh, China was actually the main driver of economic growth. And when we emerged from the... Uh, financial crisis just over a decade ago, it was Chinese investment that was was dr driving the world economy along. Um, but as China has slowed because of its own domestic problems, they're running out of labor supply. There is also a serious problem in the property market. China has ceased to have quite such a dominant influence on world growth. And as we emerge from COVID, um, that uh, has again become very apparent, certainly in the last few months. Now, the effects of the Great Split are that companies um, which were heavily integrated in the West and heavily integrated in China, I think Apple is the best example. Uh, Apple is almost a Chinese company. Most of the parts that you have in your smartphones are made in China. Uh, country, companies like Apple are sort of caught in the middle. Um, but they're trying to reduce their exposure to risk. Uh, Apple, for example, has just set up some assembly units in India, um, but they're still very tied to China. Um, if conflict were to break out with China over Taiwan, for example, which everybody's discussing, I'm 
personally very sceptical that, that the war will break out. But if it did, um, the first consequence uh, would be that China would blockade Taiwan and it wouldn't be possible for the Taiwanese to export the semiconductors from their uh, high high end plant, which are the basis of almost all our modern industries. So there would be the mother of all crises, um, because the Western economies hinge on the supply of these advanced chips made in Taiwan. So you know we could have a catastrophe. I don't want to exaggerate and, and make people afraid, um, but that's, that we're, we're operating in a world of quite high risks here uh, and preventing this current Cold War with China uh, developing in a, uh, into a hot war seems to be our top priority. And the Ukraine situation where the Chinese have loosely allied themselves to Russia in a non-committal kind of way, um, is is potentially acting as a catalyst for conflict. That's the worry. I see. Uh, thank you. Um, I guess as as we're moving kind of further into a, a more digital age, how do you see the kind of global trade norms that we have come accustomed to um, adapting as well within this? Well. Um, as we become more digital, all all the traditional types of trading agreements, which is how about how you export uh, textiles or cars within a, um, a set of rules, those those become less and less important. And what becomes more and more important is data flows. Uh, and at the moment, there is no international agreement on what should happen. Uh, you may have seen in the press this morning that Facebook, now called Meta, were fined a large sum of money, I think a billion dollars or something, uh, because they were exporting uh, people's data from Europe to the United States without permission, without people's infringing people's uh, privacy. So there is no, at the moment, there is no agreement between Europe and the United States, let alone with China, as to how data flows uh, in the digital age should actually be governed and what should be the rules of, of conduct. It prob that probably is the biggest outstanding um, trade policy issue. Uh, and at the moment, we're in a, a no man's land. And, and we've got a question coming in here. Um, this takes us quite nicely into the idea of poverty that we might have a few more questions on actually. Um, but do you think the short term benefits of globalization outweigh the long term costs, um, such as the damage to the environment and exploitation of workers in poor countries? And uh, linked to that, they've also asked if you think that globalization is better or worse overall for, um, for poorer countries. Well, there's, there is little doubt that, um, in overall terms, in terms of net benefit, um, globalization has been enormously beneficial for humanity and in particular enormously beneficial to poor people in poor countries um but generally a positive thing i i don't, I don't accept that um the process of global integration is in itself damaging for the environment it, it's certainly true that the wrong kind of development has been damaging to the environment and um, but this is a shared problem, and the whole point about the COP conferences is a recognition that uh, the only way to move to a zero carbon or net zero carbon world is to have international agreements. So it's got to take place within a global framework. It can't happen with individual countries looking to their own individual survival. It's just not going to happen. It's a global problem. It needs global rules. And yeah. um, you, you mentioned overall that there's no doubt that globalization has been uh, positive uh, for, for poor countries. Um, what are some effective strategies then for kind of leveraging globalization in order to help to reduce poverty um, and kind of improve living standards in more developing countries? Well, I, th I think the, the, the developing countries that have done best from the globalization process are those that realized at a fairly early stage uh, 
uh, the, the the best thing that, that that they could offer to the world was a combination of um, their own natural resources, but more important, uh, the availability of a large pool of labor. Um, and a good example is, well, two examples. One is Bangladesh. Um, I remember when Bangladesh became an independent country in 1970, I think it was, after seceding from Pakistan, it was regarded as the ultimate breadbasket case. Um, over 100 million people, uh, they were terribly vulnerable to annual flooding. Uh, they appeared to have no obvious way of making a living. It looked a, a dreadful prospect. But what the Bangladeshis realized was that they could find a niche in the world markets exporting garments. Uh, and now there are millions of people in, in Bangladesh who are employed in uh, making a lot of the shirts and trousers and socks that, that you, you buy in Marks and Spencers. Um, and they've actually become the dominant, I think, textile groups and replaced China, where in China, China becoming a richer country, wages have gone up, they've moved out of uh, garment making and le left the uh, rule to, um, uh, left the space for Bangladesh. And another country, of course, is, is Vietnam. You know, Vietnam suffered terribly in the war, uh, but it was eventually reunified. Uh, it has a communist government uh, pursuing a different type of development model, but it, it is also sees the benefits of globalization. Uh, Vietnam has become a highly successful exporter. Uh, many companies that are worrying about being over-dependent on China are switching their production into Vietnam. Uh, and Vietnam has, has, has really cashed in on the process of globalization combined with the benefits of being part of an expanding region because you know Indonesia which is its next door neighbor is growing very rapidly Thailand and other countries in that area um the part of the world which so far hasn't benefited very much from globalization has been Africa um, well, it, it benefited in the short run from high commodity prices from the big boom at the turn of the century, but certainly in the last 10 years hasn't benefited so much. I think there's a recognition in Africa that they, they are part of the world economy. They need to trade more with each other and with the rest of the world. They're attracting in uh, Chinese investments, become quite a big feature in, in Africa. Um, and the more thoughtful um, African governments are looking at ways of adding value uh, to what were traditional commodity exports following a pattern of much in, as in the colonial times. So in order to get past that, uh, find ways of adding value to exports. But to do that, you, you, you need to have um, a sensible exchange rate. Um, you need to have political stability. The country that was seemed to be doing best was Ethiopia, but they've been ravaged by civil war. Um, but other countries, I mean, Kenya is a country I know well and I've worked in. Uh, they've developed a, a niche in in you know thing, things like market gardening, asparagus, carnations, um, and yeah, hundreds of thousands of smallholder farmers in Kenya earn a living from um, successful forms of globalization. Okay, thank you. And I, I guess a, a criticism that is often levied is that um, globalization can potentially lead to a uh, so-called race to the bottom, especially with regards to kind of uh, working conditions, for instance. Um, I just wondered what your, your, your thoughts about that were. Uh, no, I, 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 I don't think the evidence supports that. Um, uh, what's happened in East Asia is that countries, the initially relatively small countries, Korea and, and Taiwan, um, benefited as, as their living standards grew. They moved out of the low-cost production. It went to China. China, is in turn, has acquired relatively higher wages. Uh, there's now a labor shortage in many parts of China. Um, and so the really low cost production is moving somewhere else, Vietnam, Bangladesh, whatever. Um, 
so it, it's in a way it's the opposite of the drive to the bottom you're getting a global labor market in which demand is 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 pushing up real wages in in poorer countries um you know there there are there are some places which uh, where governments try to offer more and more uh, generous subsidies uh, and, and and other things which are probably not in their uh, medium long term interest but by and large um globalization has seen a form of progression upwards rather than progression downwards in uh, working conditions okay great um, so moving on slightly then, you mentioned uh, the idea of regional blocks, and I just wondered what your thoughts were about the extent to which regionalism either kind of complements or maybe even contradicts uh, the idea of the globalisation in general. Really. Well, I think there was a worry at one point that the European Union uh, would become an inward looking block uh, and work against the globalisation process, but that hasn't happened. Um, there has been a, a gradual deepening uh, of trade and, and integration in Europe uh, until Brexit, which was, of course, a big negative from that point of view. Um, and the European Union has actually led the way in terms of market opening. Um, the European Union has a pretty good record in opening its markets to developing economies um, with textiles, um, tropical fruits and things of this kind. It's not perfect, but it's it's generally moved in in the right direction. Um, no, I, th I think I think m most of the regional groups I put on that uh, chart um, are characterized by what, what you could call open regionalism. Um, in other words, they've been it's trade creation rather than trade diversion uh, following the economic theory. Um, the big area that so far hasn't benefited uh, either from global integration or from regional integration has been Africa. But there is now a big move um, to remove quite a lot of the, the barriers to trade, which are often not tariffs and quotas, but simply the fact that you know, trucks spend three days sitting at a border trying to get through customs posts and just removing the kind of obstacles um, which enable trade to flow much more easily. Uh, and, and certainly in the eastern African area where you've got Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Zambia, um, Mozambique, um, you're beginning to get an upsurge in regional trade which is not at the expense of the world it is actually um but it it's 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 a positive development in trade creation okay right. and i guess kind of slightly leading on from that as well do you think that there are things that um some of the less developed regional blocks can take from the more developed ones like the european union some lessons of I, I, th I think the, the the big lesson to be learned is that um, regional integration has got to be more than just an excuse for combined protectionism. There was an attempt uh, 30, 40 years ago uh, to integrate Latin America behind protective walls, um, and it didn't work. Um, and there were growing conflict in Central America and South America as countries' interests diverged. Um, but the Latin Americans are now trying to integrate regionally through what's called Mercosur, which is mainly Brazil and Argentina, but with some of the smaller countries like Uruguay and Paraguay, uh, not just integrating between them, but also striking trade deals with the rest of the world, including the European Union. Uh, so th there is an understanding that you can do regional integration in the wrong way. Uh, and it's now being, um, they're following more the European model. Okay. Um, again, moving on slightly to the idea of globalization being under threat. And you've talked about um, stuff regarding making America great again, the rise of populist movements and so on and so forth. Um, do you think that this is kind of, had a, a strong impact on the course of globalization, or do you think it's more of a, a, a blip? Well, I think it depends very much. Um, it, it shouldn't be this way, but I think it depends very much on what happens in the next American presidential elections. 
Um, if Trump is re-elected, uh, and there's a reasonable probability that that will happen, it's fairly clear that he will double down on American nationalism and the more protectionist approach to trade and investment. Um, and if that happens, uh, the Europeans will probably retaliate. It will be get it will get more and more difficult to have uh, constructive relationships between the United States and East Asia. Uh, and then superimposed on top of that, you've got the conflict with China. So it, 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 it I think if Trump is re-elected, the omens are very bad. Um, of course, the other thing we have to be mindful of is that if something happens which causes a major crash in the world economy, we've had several that nobody anticipated, really, the financial crisis, the collapse of the banks, and then the pandemic. Um, because when you have a, a serious crash of that kind, um, politicians' natural instincts are to protect the jobs of their own workers and put up barriers. So what happens in the 1930s, um, it almost happened in the financial crisis and it almost happened again with the pandemic. And if if something happened, um, we can't predict what it would be. Another financial crisis could be a war uh, which um, led to um, a major economic downturn then there is a risk we could get back into that downward spiral that I illustrated with the cobweb. Um, so th those are two things that, that could be negative. What, one is Trump back again, uh, and the other is a, an unexpected economic crisis that causes uh, major groups of countries to turn inward. Yeah, I, I completely understand that point. And I guess it's, a, it's easy for kind of politicians has been a particular narrative when economic conditions aren't particularly favorable um but how how do you think we can kind of better communicate the benefits of globalization especially within that context when uh when, when people are seeing their living standards falling around them and so on and so forth well, I think the one thing that we do need to have is, is, is a, I use this slightly awkward phrase, global governance. You do need to have a cooperative um, set of arrangements internationally to head off disasters. In 2008, 2009, we could have had a repetition of the awfulness of the 1930s. We didn't. And one of the main reasons we didn't was because the main economies of the world um, the United States, the European Union, Japan and China um, cooperated uh, and acted in a coordinated way. Um, and, and, you know, as a result, we we, we got a reasonably uh, prompt global recovery. Um, but if that cooperation isn't there uh, and you then start to get into a kind of beggar my neighbour mentality and a conflict mentality, then the crisis feeds on itself uh, and international connections become negative. So I think the, 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 the answer to your question is, is persuading people, and particularly persuading business, that there is a secure, uh, cooperative set of relationships between the major economies to head off disaster. Thanks. Great. Um, sorry, a another question. I, I guess globalization has often been blamed for allowing kind of large multinational corporations to exert influence over um, over national governments, really. Uh, do you think that's a fair criticism? And if so, um, do you think there's a way of addressing that imbalance? Well, um, I don't. I don't think there's a general answer to that. I mean, it depends um, what kind of government we're talking about. Um, the United States uh, and the European Union are able to stand up to very big companies. Um, the European Union, for example, as I mentioned, has just imposed big fines on the platform companies like um, Facebook. They, they did the same thing with Microsoft and Google. Um, the American government, the federal government, um, is able to uh, exercise its very considerable muscle in, in areas like public procurement to get companies to do what it wants to do. 
um, and the big emerging markets, you know, China, um, you know, if, if company, companies want to be in China because it's such a vast market, but uh, the Chinese government is very tough, um, uh, very tough at negotiating, frequently interferes. Um, it's very political in the way it operates. So in, in many of these countries, um, international companies are on the back foot. Um, but if you're in a very small, poor country and a, and a big multinational company comes along and offers uh, to uh, provide some big facility, um, which is very difficult to say no, then, of course, they, they get to dictate the terms. So I, I, I used to belong some years ago to the Commonwealth Secretariat, where we had a, a unit uh, that provided technical assistance to very small states in order to help them negotiate better deals for, you know, for example, mining project. Uh, and you, that's why the United Nations agencies and the World Bank and, and other bodies come in, that, that they can, um, you know, provide that kind of support. But, you know, big companies can bully small countries um, because there is a big disproportion of power. Uh, and so the countries need to get together, uh, cooperate, uh, and get outside help. Thanks. And um, I've, I've left this one till the end, because I think it's a good one to finish on from Sophia. Um, what has been the biggest challenge of your career? Uh, well, it, it was actually being a, a, a member of the government in very difficult circumstances. I, I had the, um, I was responsible for business, for trade, for universities, uh, among science, amongst other, had a very big government department, and, and it was in the aftermath of the financial crisis. Banks were not lending, um, and I and my colleagues had the challenge of um, helping the British economy to recover from what had been a, a devastating blow. It was like an economic heart attack, and we had to keep the patient alive and and um, functioning. So I, I had to make a lot of very painful and difficult decisions at that time. I, I think you know many of them have actually survived to this day. The, uh, something of which I set up at the time was called the British Business Bank, which was the main vehicle by which business was supported through the pandemic. And it's now uh, critical to the Labour Party's plan should it come into office for you know long term investment. So. Um, yeah, there were challenges. They were very painful, some of them. Um, but th that was the most satisfying period of my life as well. Yeah, I can completely imagine that. Yeah, and I, I guess just before we go, is what is there anything that you kind of taken from that period or kind of learned specifically from that that period of government? Well, I think the the, the striking message were, was that there there aren't any easy choices in economics. You know, you um, there is no such thing as a free lunch. I, th I think one of the problems we have in Britain at the moment is that people want better public services, they want low taxes, and they also want the country to be financially stable. They, they don't want a repetition of the chaos we had with Liz Truss. But of course, these three things are not compatible. That if people want better services, health services, education, the rest, they've got to be paid for. And the British economy is not growing very strongly. And we're going to have to get used to the idea of higher taxes. It's not going to be a popular. No politician wants to talk about it. But that, unfortunately, is the brutal reality of the position we're in. Great. Um, and, and on that note, I think we will leave things there. Vince Cable, thank you very much for joining us today um, for the fifth of our Econ Club series. We really appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to speak to us. Um, thank you. No problem at all. Uh, for everybody else on the call, a recording will be made available to you shortly so that if anybody has missed it, they can they can watch it later on. Um, but Vince Cable, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Okay.